Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. And now it's a pleasure to uh, welcome another external speaker. Uh, Bernhard Schurkopf is director of the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Tübingen in Germany. Um, I saw, Bernard, that you also had a, a, a short time at Microsoft Research uh, in the Cambridge Lab at the past, but now he's been with Max Planck for a while and he's going to share his uh, thoughts on machine learning, AI. Here you go. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? So I'm very happy to speak after Tony Hoar. It's, first of all, a great honor. It also uh, reminds me of my time at Microsoft. Uh, I was a very young researcher. He uh, was already a Turing Award winner, and he was uh, knighted during the time I worked for Microsoft. And uh, he nevertheless always had time to give advice, and I very much uh, uh, remember my conversation with him and the influence they had on my later career, uh, even though I was probably just one of many people that he talked to. Uh, it's also very nice to speak after Tony's talk because uh, I think my talk is somewhat uh, complimentary and maybe together we cover two of the important uh, directions in computing. Uh, if we think that the important directions might be number one, deduction, and number two, induction. So I will try to say something about induction today. And uh, you will also see that uh, maybe reflected in the style of my talk, induction is something much messier than deduction. You get these beautiful slides, wide background, very few, only the minimum number of words. Uh, you will see something very different now. Um, but I hope you'll find it interesting. So I will talk about empirical inference. And I work at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. And uh, at this institute, our long-term goal is to understand the organizing principles of complex behavior. So I have a few videos here. So you can see a, a white blood cell in pursuit of a bacteria. You see a, a frog uh, trying to catch an insect up here. Uh, what else? You can see a human doing something which is called parkour, uh, which is uh, quite impressive motor behavior. Um, and finally, you can see this group of humans uh, engaging also in uh, a complex uh, joint or complex collective behavior, performing a double chorus of Bach cantata. Um, this is actually an interesting, uh, an interesting story. It's an interesting story about this. Uh, apparently, Mozart, when he visited Leipzig, went to see a performance of this uh, cantata, uh, Singer dem Herrn, and uh, he liked it so much that he wanted to get hold of the score. Uh, which he didn't manage, so he just sat down in the evening in a pub and wrote it down from memory. So humans can do impressive things, and we are obviously very far away from doing any of this uh, using artificial systems. But uh, we try to uh, do some simpler things and use machine learning to do these simpler things, and this is an example of what something we can do. This is when you go to a shopping website, so suppose you're looking for this object, which is called a glass circular cutter. So it's a, a cutter that you attach to a glass, and then you can make a, a nice round cut. So if you go to Amazon, you shop for this, then from past purchases of other customers, we can learn that people trying to buy this kind of item might be interested in other things to go along with it, and then we can make suitable recommendations. And this is a, a live example. Well, not live, but it's a real example from the Amazon website. So what? It, Amazon turns out uh, recommending is this uh, thing called a balaclava uh, down here, a baseball bat, brand name hooligan. And uh, this one is a little bit more curious. This is a Batman rucksack with bat wings. <laughs> now, a little more seriously or more abstract, uh, if we think of this problem of empirical inference or drawing conclusions from empirical data, uh, we might think of the example of scientific inference. So suppose we are physicists and we have measured two observables, x and y, and we find the, observable, the, the measurements to lie approximately on a straight line. So in this, in this case, we might hypothesize that there is a, a linear law underlying the data. But uh, already Leibniz uh, noticed that even if we have random data, so Leibniz was thinking of taking a quill pen, dipping it into the ink, and then shaking it over paper, uh, even for random data, we probably can find some slightly more complicated mathematical expression that explains these data points. 
which then begs the question, uh, uh, would we call this a law or when would we call it a law? And uh, Leibniz already had the right intuition and, and thought that we would only call it a law of nature if it's simple in some sense. Uh, this, of course, implies uh, the question, what do we mean by simple and what kind of guarantees can we make? And this is something that's studied in statistical learning theory nowadays. So a number of people, especially mathematicians, have thought about this problem. For physicists, this uh, problem was much easier as exemplified by Rutherford, who once said, if your experiment needs statistics, you ought to have done a better experiment. So the science is in the data and how you generate the data and what you do with the data should be, should be trivial. So we don't believe this anymore nowadays. So let me show a second example. This is something taken from biology or more precisely from perception. So if you look at these handwritten digits, you have no problems recognizing the digits so, or assigning the images to the correct class label. But if I now apply a fixed uh, permutation to the pixels, so the same permutation in each image, uh, then these, these patterns uh, representing the images suddenly look much more complicated. And uh, you'll find it harder to uh, distinguish them, even though maybe you can see that the zeros tend to look uh, different from the, from the threes. And uh, mathematically, uh, if we represent these images as vectors, uh, then the, the sequence of the pixels doesn't really matter. Uh, as long as we perform uh, sort of standard geometric uh, algorithms on these vectors. So for most learning algorithms, these images might be the same. But to us as humans, the problem suddenly looks quite hard. And, uh, and that seems to be a contradiction. But of course, the answer is that uh, the original images only appeared easy to us because we've been trained on this kind of data all our lives. So in fact, in reality, maybe both problems are difficult. Uh, and our brain can solve the first problem is because it has been trained all our lives and extracted statistical regularities. And in fact, in the words of Horace Barlow, a famous neuroscientist, the brain is nothing but a statistical decision organ. Now, I showed you one example from scientific inference, uh, one from perception. Um, it looks like perception is hard, science is easy, but in fact, science can also be hard if we look for the right problems. And nowadays, people are solving <coughs> problems in science using non-trivial inference. And this is an example from bioinformatics. So here the task is to classify a human, a, a human DNA sequence locations uh, into certain classes that are biologically relevant. I won't go into the details. Um, the interesting thing about this problem is that uh, we have a huge training set, 15 million examples. Um, if we only use a few hundred or thousand training examples, then our performance is essentially chance level. So we might as well guess. So if we look at this data set as humans, we would not see structure. It would look random to us. But if we use uh, these machine learning methods, and I won't go into detail now, uh, then using a sufficiently large uh, set of examples, uh, we will do very well. And this uh, thing will not look random at all. We will have found some structure in the world. So we have methods nowadays with which we can find non-trivial structure uh, that's not obvious to humans. So in this sense, we have already achieved uh, superhuman intelligence, if you want, in some very restricted domains. And these domains are uh, characterized, in this case, or these, these hard inference problems, uh, as one might call them, are typically characterized by high dimensionality, uh, uh, complex uh, regularities. Uh, little prior knowledge, by which I mean we don't have an explicit mechanistic model uh, that explains the data. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, the need for big data sets and computers uh, and methods to process these data sets automatically. Now, one of the crucial uh, um, problems of machine learning is uh, referred to as generalization. And I want to give you a little bit of an intuition uh, why this is a non-trivial problem. So suppose you have observed this uh, simple number sequence here, and I asked you what's the, the next digit. Anyone would like to guess? 11, that's a very good guess. So there's a, a very simple law that explains why it should be 11. And this sequence even has a name. Uh, I can explain to you afterwards if you're interested. It's called the lazy caterer sequence. Um, but 12 is also fine. Uh, in the case of 12, we have this simple law. Uh, if we want 13, we could say it's the Tribunacci sequence. Each number is the sum of the three previous ones. Uh, if it's 14, we could say actually this is the set of divisors of 28. It stops after 28. Um, there's another set, another nice continuation. The next, according to a former postdoc combined, the next uh, sequence should actually be one because obviously this is a decimal expansion of pi and e interleaved. And uh, you don't even need e. If you want, you can also just look up where do these four digits appear in the decimal expansion of pi. 
and you find it's in position 16,992. And then we can look up how the expansion continues there. There's even a website, uh, the online encyc encyclopedia of integer sequences, where you can enter these digits and you get meaningful continuations and you find uh, more than 600 hits last time I looked. So obviously, if we ask the question which continuation is correct or generalizes, there's really no way to tell. And uh, philosophers call this the induction problem. Now we can try to ask a slightly easier question, which is what statistical learning theory does. This is more of a methodological question. Uh, we don't ask which law is correct. We ask what kind of methods should we apply such that we typically uh, come up with laws that generalize. So that's such that we find laws that will probably do almost as well uh, in the future as uh, we have done in the past. And this problem also corresponds to a well-known problem from philosophy. This was called the uh, Abgrenzungsproblem or demarcation problem uh, by uh, Popper. And uh, uh, it was attributed to Kant by Popper. Uh, and it's the problem what separates physics from metaphysics. So what kind of methods should you be using such that you can call yourself a physicist rather than a metaphysicist? So this problem was uh, formalized in the theory of machine learning or statistical learning theory, uh, starting with a with the simple uh, task of pattern recognition, by which uh, people mean the case where we have some inputs and we want to assign them to two classes, plus and minus one. Um, and the people who pioneered this direction are Vapnik and were Vapnik and Chernyenkis, uh, both during their PhD thesis in Russia at the Institute uh, for Control Science of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And they looked at this problem where they, they assumed that uh, we have these observations. Each observation is a pair of an input and a class label plus minus one. Uh, we assume they are generated independent and identically distributed from some underlying uh, probability law. So this is a, a, an underlying random experiment. And uh, our goal now is uh, to uh, infer a function from these observations, a function which will also uh, take as input uh, points from this domain X and produces outputs uh, plus minus one labels. Uh, a function which will minimize the expected uh, error and the expected error is computed uh, by taking an average or expectation with respect to the underlying distribution which we don't know. We only have data from this distribution. Uh, an average over this uh, function here or this functional which is called the zero one loss function if you think of, look at it for a second, y takes values plus minus one, f of x takes values plus minus one, so this can be either zero or two, and we divide by two, so this quantity is one if and only if f of x is not equal to y, zero otherwise. Uh, so its expectation is the expected error for data generated by the same, same unknown uh, underlying regularity. Uh, we can't compute it because we don't know this distribution, so what we need is an induction principle to find a function uh, that might not exactly minimize this uh, risk, so-called risk, uh, but that will at least get close to minimizing it. And the induction principle that Vapnik Chamanik has studied is called uh, uh, empirical risk minimization. Uh, it consists of replacing this quantity that we would like to minimize with its empirical counterpart. So this is the same quantity, but only evaluated on the training points. Uh, this is also called the training error or empirical risk, and now we have to minimize this quantity over a class of functions. Now the question is whether this is consistent. So consistent means, roughly speaking, in statistics, does it lead to the optimal answer in the limit of infinitely many data points? And it turns out the answer is no, without additional assumptions. And uh, uh, the additional assumption uh, that we need is we need a restriction on the, the size of the function class. So it turns out that uh, um, from the law of large numbers, uh, we can easily prove that this quantity, for any fixed function, this quantity will converge towards this one in probability. But if we have a large set of functions, it turns out uh, even if for each fixed function here, this uh, empirical uh, risk or this training error converges to the true error in probability, uh, this doesn't imply that the minimizer of the training error or the minimum of the training error, which is what empirical risk minimization tells us we should be using, uh, converges to the minimum of this other curve. So it turns out this is exactly related to the difference between pointwise convergence and uniform convergence that you might know from mathematics. Uh, 
Um, I won't go into details on this, uh, but the main message is whether uh, the minimum converges uh, depends on how large this function class is. If the function class only contains of one function, then the law of large numbers is enough. But if we have a huge function class, it turns out we have to worry about uh, um, uh, the complexity of our function class. And to this end, Vapnik uh, Chemonikis uh, came up with this notion of VC dimension, which is a measure for the uh, richness of a function class. And it turns out if this VC dimension uh, is uh, finite, then empirical risk minimization can be proven to be consistent, so to work in the, in the limit, no matter what the underlying probability distribution is. So that's maybe the most important theorem of statistical learning theory. And uh, the VC dimension uh, is a combinatorial quantity uh, I'll just briefly say it, but it doesn't, if you don't follow this, it's not important at this point. It's defined to be the maximum number of points which can be classified in all possible ways using functions from our class. So for instance, if, uh, if we use the class of linear functions, linear classifiers, so separating data sets into two classes with a straight line, it turns out if we have three points, we can separate them in all possible ways, two to the three uh, uh, possible ways using such functions. Uh, once we have four points, we can't do this anymore. Therefore, the VC dimension will be three. And uh, more generally, in uh, d-dimensional spaces, the VC dimension uh, using this uh, kind of construction or using this function class uh, will be uh, d plus one. So in d-dimensional spaces, d plus one. Uh, but it turns out, uh, so that's, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, we would like the VC dimension to be small if we want to learn. The smaller, the faster we can learn, the fewer data points we need. At the same time, we want to work in high-dimensional spaces. In this case, the VC dimension grows with the dimensionality, but there are interesting cases uh, that are nowadays used in machine learning where we try to separate data points not just by any straight line, but one which will induce a large margin of separation, in which case one can prove that the, that the, the VC dimension will not grow as fast. So it turns out, in this case, it will be inversely proportional to the uh, square of this margin of separation. So to uh, uh, come to the conclusion of this part about learning theory, um, the kind of results that one can then derive in terms of a VC dimension, the kind of generalization error bounds uh, or methodological prescription, if you want, uh, the kind of bounds looks like this. So the bounds will tell us that the test error of our system uh, will be upper bounded by the training error plus some confidence term uh, with high probability, where the probability we could, for instance, adjust to 99%, in which case we have this delta equal to 1%, uh, which appears in this formula. And this confidence term that characterizes how uh, much the training error might mislead us about the test error that we haven't seen yet, the confidence term that depends on this VC dimension and on the sample size, the number of observations that we have seen. So uh, uh, if we have seen a lot of observations, we might be able to, uh, to use a large VC dimension and still have a small confidence term. Um, and the interesting thing now is if you think about applying this, so suppose you, you try to learn something that cannot be learned. Let's say you take the telephone directory of Cambridge and you try to learn a mapping that will take as an input the name of a person and produce as an output their telephone number. So we believe we, we can't really learn this. We could only memorize it. There is no, uh, unless people uh, use some kind of algorithm to make up the telephone number. So suppose uh, this is really not possible. And then we would find to learn this mapping well with a small training error, uh, we would have to use a huge system, a huge neural network with uh, millions of parameters, or maybe an actual lookup table, which is also a very complex uh, mapping. Uh, in this case, we might have a low training error, but this quantity will be very large. So we won't be able to, to, to guarantee that our system will work in the future. If a new person moves to Cambridge, we won't be able to predict their telephone number. On the other hand, uh, if we use a small system such that this uh, quantity is small, we will find that we won't be able to actually explain the given data to find a, to find a map mapping that will correctly reproduce all telephone numbers of people that already have a telephone connection in Cambridge. So there's this trade-off between number of data points and complexity of the function class. And this is uh, uh, cast into these kinds of inequalities. Uh, and that's uh, one of the crucial aspects of, of, of what's, uh, what's happening in machine learning. And in one way or another, uh, be it using regular, regularization theory or complexity of function classes or Bayesian priors, one way or another, you have to uh, take this into account when you do uh, machine learning. 
Now, what's a, a second aspect that's interesting that I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is uh, this method of using kernels to construct function classes. So I told you it's important to use uh, uh, function classes whose VC dimension can be uh, characterized or can be uh, controlled and kept small. At the same time, we want function classes that are rich enough to explain real-world data. And there's this nice trick uh, using kernels. Uh, and the idea is uh, to map the data into a higher dimensional space and in this space to do something linear. And in the linear case, we know how to control the VC dimension uh, by maximizing the margin of separation. So in this trivial example here, we might start with two-dimensional data. Uh, the true decision boundary might be this ellipse here. So we want to separate blue from red. Uh, now suppose we map our two-dimensional points into a three-dimensional space uh, by this uh, three-dimensional mapping. So we compute all monomials of degree three. Then it turns out, uh, just since this is an axis-aligned uh, ellipse, uh, this separation boundary will be a straight, uh, will be a hyperplane in this three-dimensional space. And moreover, it turns out if we look at this mapping, if we took two points, x and x prime, and both mapped them both into this space, then it turned out we could rewrite the dot product in the three-dimensional space as the square of the dot product in the original space. So this, that seems like a funny coincidence, uh, but it's actually a very nice coincidence because it means, in this case, since we, since we know how to compute the dot products in this three-dimensional space as a simple function of something done in the in input space, uh, we might not have to carry out this mapping into the three-dimensional space in the first place. So maybe between two and three dimensions, that doesn't matter. But in, in fact, the way people use this, the, the space on the right-hand side might even be infinite dimensional. So we could do a similar kind of trick for infinite dimensional data. Uh, and uh, for, it turns out there's a certain class, <laughs> class of kernel functions uh, which correspond to dot products in associated spaces. These spaces are called feature spaces or reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Um, and whenever we use such a kernel, we know that actually we're doing nothing but computing a dot product in such a linear space. That's very nice because in these Hilbert spaces or, or dot product spaces, we can construct geometric algorithms. We know how to compute angles, distances, etc. So uh, these uh, functions, these kernel functions K are called kernel functions. And the correct class of functions uh, that one should use is called positive definite kernels. They're well known from approximation theory. Uh, I won't go into the details. There's a simple definition of what's a positive definite kernel. And it's a reasonably uh, simple to prove that a kernel, so a function of two arguments, uh, which is symmetric, uh, a kernel is positive uh, definite if and only if there exists a map into a Hilbert space that says that the kernel corresponds to the dot product in that space. Okay, so uh, the most famous use of these kernel methods uh, is support vector machines. So in a support vector machine, you have a classification problem with two classes uh, in the simplest case. You map them into high dimensional space, compute a large margin separation. And uh, if we do this, then we get a nonlinear separation in the input space. And depending on what kernel we choose, the kernel will determine this mapping. Uh, depending on what kernel we choose, this uh, uh, nonlinear separation will be more or less nonlinear in the input space. And here I'm actually turning up the nonlinearity by choosing a Gaussian kernel whose width I'm turning down. And you can see I'm getting more and more nonlinear decision boundaries here. So this is also an example of a nonlinear decision boundary, uh, which is linear in some other space. But uh, more seriously, so these are uh, further examples of nonlinear decision boundaries or nonlinear uh, surfaces. Uh, which all correspond to hyperplanes in a suitable uh, Hilbert space. So one can do various things with it. In this case, we actually uh, work together with computer graphics people to uh, construct this uh, morphing algorithm. Uh, another application uh, of, or another algorithm that can be uh, performed in terms of kernels is uh, called kernel principle component analysis. So in this algorithm, we are not trying to classify data, but we are trying to look for variance in data for structures. So principal component analysis is a well-known method from statistics that looks for direction of large variance. And it turns out if we look for these directions in the Hilbert space associated with a kernel, then these directions of large variance then correspond to these 
nonlinear features of the original data. And uh, in this case, we have a data set with three clusters. It turns out that two, the first two directions separate the data into the clusters. So this first uh, component separates this cluster from this. The next component then separates this cluster from the union of those two because this separation has already been uh, protected out it's in principle component analysis. So we just need to care about separating this from the union. And then the higher order uh, components look for structure within the clusters, uh, but also in an interesting way. So for instance, this, this one looks for structure in this direction and this one looks for structure in this direction, etc. And a number of other uh, methods for uh, dimensionality reduction can be viewed as special cases of this. So in the next uh, few minutes, I want to show you a few examples of machine learning. Uh, and then I will uh, move into the second part of the talk where I will try to motivate that actually machine learning based on statistical information is not the full story. And in many cases, we, we should be thinking about where this statistical information actually comes from, what underlies uh, statistical associations. And this will lead to a, will lead to a discussion of, of causal learning. So first, a few examples. So this is an example of a project we did together with people in medical imaging. Uh, it's a nice example because it's now uh, it was licensed to Siemens and it's incorporated in a certain type of medical scanner. Uh, here, the problem was that uh, so we worked together with a colleague who was working on uh, PET and MR scanners, so scanners that do positron emission tomography and magnetic resonance at the same time. So this is a non-trivial problem because you have to uh, construct detectors for PET that work in high magnetic fields. Um, but from the medical point of view, it uh, sh should be in many cases preferred to a traditional scanner, which would combine PET positron emission tomography uh, with computer tomography, uh, which is an X-ray method. Uh, X-ray is, of course, a much higher radiation uh, uh, damage. So traditionally, uh, these two methods were combined, uh, which had the advantage that one could uh, compute what's called the attenuation correction uh, using this CT signal. So the, the, the PET signal gets attenuated as it passes through matter, and it turns out that this attenuation can be very well predicted from the CT image. So if you do these things together, then you can normalize the PET image correctly, which means you can identify a tumor no matter whether it's right in the middle of your head or close to the end. This wasn't possible anymore using a magnetic resonance PET scanner. But in this case, what we did is we used a set of training data where we had taken both MR and CT images for patients, a set of training data to learn this regularity, to learn the mapping from MR to CT. So to given an MR image, uh, construct a synthetic CT image. And then we can use this CT image to correct the PET image uh, with almost the same results. So here's another example. This is uh, using something called reinforcement learning, uh, which is a little different from uh, what I told you so far, but it's also a data-driven learning method. So in this case, we have this little uh, Japanese game where you're supposed to catch a ball with this cup. And uh, in the first uh, uh, image, you saw our PhD student uh, teaching the robot arm roughly what is the movement. And then afterwards, uh, the system first uh, the system tries to reproduce this movement and observes what the ball does. What we then feed back into the learning algorithm is the distance of the ball as it falls down, uh, passing this uh, plane, uh, horizontal plane uh, defined by the position of this cup. The closer this distance is, the better is the current movement, and therefore the system tries to adjust its so-called policy or its, its, its motion generation uh, uh, method uh, such that this distance gets smaller. And uh, after 15 trials, uh, it's already significantly better. And uh, so this is now uh, the final uh, uh, system, which I think is after about 100 trials. and. Uh, 100 trials is similar to what it takes a human if you have never played this game before. Uh, but the difference is that uh, if you've done it the first time, you can't reproduce it, whereas this system, once it has learned it, it can al almost always do it. So here's a second example uh, of a learning system. So in this, this is an example from image processing. So here we have a, a, an image sequence taken, let me pause this, um, taken through uh, the uh, exhaust of the air conditioning system in our building uh, of a distant uh, chimney and uh, the raw sequence you just saw. So what we now do is we try to explain this raw sequence uh, as a underlying image, a latent image that we haven't seen uh, 
uh, convolve with something generated by turbulence and using the assumption that we think that the underlying image is stationary. And you will now see the reconstruction in the middle. And uh, actually, you can see that the reconstruction already after 13 images, which is where I paused it, is quite good. And it gets a little bit sharper. And at the end, it's essentially as sharp as the ground truth image here. Oh, it's the same thing again. OK. So this was the raw sequence. And now you can see in the middle the reconstruction uh, getting sharper. OK, so now. Uh, tell you a little bit more about kernel methods and what people do with kernel methods nowadays. Um, so remember kernel methods, we were saying uh, we have, we choose a kernel. This kernel generates a mapping of our data space into an associated reproducing kernel Hilbert space in which we can perform some simple linear methods. Now let's assume uh, we want to construct the simplest possible learning algorithms. So this is uh, an example that we did for a book that we wrote about kernel methods. So I was really thinking, what's the simplest uh, you could do? In this case, what we did is we took uh, two classes of data points, uh, we mapped them into the feature space. So let's say this is already the image in the feature space now. And uh, now we will assign a test point, which could be anywhere, to the class whose mean is closer. So we compute both means and then assign this to the uh, class whose mean is closer. Uh, obviously, this uh, induces a hyperplane uh, decision boundary. So the set of all points that's closer to here than to here is actually this half space separated from the other half space by this hyperplane. And if we just substitute this into the decision rule, so we compute this distance in terms of uh, uh, dot products, so it can be written in terms of kernels, compute this distance, it's again uh, expressible in terms of dot products. Then we get to a decision boundary, which looks well known to statisticians, because what this decision boundary uh, corresponds to is uh, it does a density, so called density estimate of the one class. It's a Parson Windows estimate. You put a little window function or a little uh, kernel on each data point, and you sum over the data points. So it's like you're smoothing out the data points to get a density estimate. Uh, it, and it computes a density estimate for the other class. And then it essentially looks uh, which class is more likely uh, to, uh, to perform the classification. Now, that's interesting, because this means that we have now represented each data set, or each data set somehow as a density estimate. And actually, it turns out, and this was uh, an area of active development in the last uh, 10 years, uh, that it's uh, very interesting to think about such uh, mappings of data points, not just individual points, but sets of points into repetition kernel Hilbert spaces, uh, and uh, to think about what, ki what kind of information these mappings retain. We can ask, uh, what kind of information do we retain if we map a set of points? into such a feature space. And it turns out, if you use a linear kernel, we just retain the mean, because we are mapping each point into the space and then computing the mean. So that's now our, our definition of the map for a set of points. Uh, that's trivial. So if we use a linear kernel, we just remember the mean. If we use a polynomial kernel of degree n, it turns out what we retain is exactly the first n moments, statistical moments of a data set. If we use what's called a strictly positive definite kernel, and one example of this is a so-called Gaussian kernel, it turns out we lose no information. So this mapping is injective. Even though we map to one element of our repetition kernel Hilbert space, we can reconstruct all the points that have contributed to this map uh, from this volume element in principle. And we can generalize this to uh, distributions. So rather than mapping a set of points, we can map a whole distribution. And the way we do this is we uh, sample points from the distribution, map each of those points into the repetition kernel Hilbert space, and then compute the expectation. So the average over this sampling procedure. Again, it turns out uh, if we use a linear kernel, then trivially we just retain the expectations. So that it means we represent a distribution by its mean. Of course, that loses a lot of information. If we use a, a polynomial kernel, we represent a distribution by its moments uh, up to a certain order. And if we use what's called a characteristic kernel, and again, a Gaussian is an example of this, then uh, we retain all information. So we can now think of our distributions and whatever we want to do with them. Um, we can think of them as elements of this Hilbert space, and we can perform linear algebra on them. And one can do various interesting things with this. And this has been a very active area of research in recent years. Uh, we can first we can uh, re uh, we can view uh, interesting uh, special cases known from statistics. So this thing here is called the moment generating function. It's a special case of this so-called kernel mean map for a particular type of kernel. 
uh, we can express uh, things like independence tests. So if we have two variables, x and y, and we want to test whether they're independent, we can do this using a geometric construction in such a Hilbert space. Uh, we can also do things like homogeneity testing, uh, Bayes rules. Uh, we can give a physical interpretation related to physics, uh, to the physics of wave optics and, and Fraunhofer diffraction. And finally, one interesting example that I wanted to talk about uh, for two or three minutes uh, is uh, um, related to uh, probabilistic programming and computing of random variables, uh, functions of random variables. And I think this is maybe uh, int of interest because it's also related to programming or maybe to the future of uh, programming in some respect. So in this case, so I told you we can use this mapping here to uh, represent a distribution uh, in a Hilbert space and then uh, perform uh, things on this distribution in that Hilbert space. Now let's assume this distribution is the distribution of a random variable. So you, so you have some quantity, uh, uh, an underlying uh, experiment, and every time you perform the experiment you get a slightly different value. So it's not a, a fixed value, but it's a distribution. Now suppose uh, you have functions that are defined uh, on the values that your random variable can take. So functions, let's say you have functions or operations on data types, you have uh, strings, integers, etc., and associated functions that take these data types as inputs and produce other data types as outputs. Uh, but now you want to lift these operations to random variables uh, taking values uh, that are of these data types. So now you have a random variable that takes values that are strings or graphs or whatever. And, uh, and you want to lift whatever you can do with strings and graph to distributions over strings and graphs. And it turns out that's something you can do uh, using this method. And essentially to do this, and I think I'll skip a few details because we lost a bit of time. Um, uh, what you, to do this, what you need to explain is given an element of a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which in the general case uh, takes this form here, plus limit points, uh, but let me not talk about this. So in the almost general case, an element of the reproducing kernel Hilbert space takes this form. Uh, and here's another random variable which is reproduced, uh, uh, represented like that. You'll now have to uh, explain and uh, show how to compute functions on these random variables. And uh, this is the formula, which I won't go into details on, but maybe I should just remind you, uh, computing the distribution of a function of random variables is non-trivial. So if you, for instance, if you had two random variables that are both Gaussian, and now you define a third random variable, which is the sum of those two, then you know that the distribution will be the convolution of the two original distributions, which is again a Gaussian. But that's about as much as you can go analytically. So in general, if your distributions are not Gaussian, or if the function that you are applying is not just addition, but something complicated, uh, there's nothing you can do analytically. So uh, this, I think, is an elegant method uh, for this kind of problem. Um, and uh, we've only just started working on this, and I should also point out What's, uh, what's nice and what makes this fit nicely with programming is that we can define kernel functions not just on vectorial data, we can define in principle kernel functions on any kind of data. We just need to prove that this positive definiteness property holds true. So there are kernel functions for uh, strings, graphs, lists, uh, you name it. So for various types of data types or, or images, uh, DNA sequences. So uh, I think this is an int interesting direction uh, to think about in the future. So uh, with this, I want to move to the last part of the talk, which is about causality. And I think I'll try to keep it relatively short, uh, just motivate it, and then show you one uh, application which is related to causality, which I'm quite excited, excited about. So I will motivate it again with a shopping uh, example uh, from the website of Amazon. Uh, and this is uh, someone else found this uh, nice example. And the example is uh, someone shops for a laptop rucksack. So it's a rucksack with a special padded uh, uh, compartment for a laptop, and then Amazon recommends that the person should buy a laptop to go with a rucksack. And, uh, and probably these purchases are statistically dependent. It probably happens significantly uh, often that people buy both at the same time. Uh, but nevertheless, it seems to, seems to be stupid to uh, recommend to someone who's looking for a, a rucksack that uh, he or she should also buy a laptop, because intuitively we think that the Buying the laptop is the cause for buying the rucksack, but not vice versa. Now, both things uh, contain information about each other. So both purchases contain information about the other one. Uh, 
Uh, but the reason for this is that, uh, that so the cause contains information about the effect because uh, the effect is controlled by the cause in some sense. Whereas uh, the effect, uh, sorry, the, yes, uh, the, the effect contains information about the, the cause, so the other direction, uh, because it carries a footprint of the cause. So we have, uh, it's clear that there's information in both ways, and if we measure it statistically, this is it's called the mutual information, and it's a symmetric concept. So it's, a, it's the same number, no matter which way around, which seems strange, because uh, from the causal point of view, it looks like, uh, the reason why A contains information about B is something else than the other way around. So it seems like there is actually a directionality there that's lost once we start talking about statistics. So from this point of view, or from the point of view of, of causality, statistics is an epiphenomenon. Uh, there's something more fundamental underlying statistics, and this is causality. And of course, there are, there are many more layers below causality, so the causal description is from my point of view, one layer below uh, statistics, but there are many further ones, and maybe uh, towards the end you get to coupled systems of differential equations, and maybe maybe at the end you have the Schrodinger equation or even uh, even something more fundamental. But my goal now is to tell you a little bit about just one step down from statistics, so what generates statistics. And uh, just to, to uh, motivate a little bit more the difference between statistics and correlation, uh, you all know this example of the storks. So, uh, we look at the human birth rate uh, in European countries and the frequency of storks, we see a strong correlation. There's a nice paper about this. Um, the countries uh, with high birth rate tend to have more storks. Uh, but of course now, if we wanted to intervene in such a system, so if we were, suppose you're a politician and you want to have a higher birth rate in your country, you won't do this by making sure you get more storks. So we wouldn't believe that uh, this kind of dependence also makes a prediction about interventions. So it's, a, it's an observation, purely observational dependence, which holds true in what we call an IID setting, so independent, identically distributed data, uh, but it doesn't say anything about the effect of interventions. So statistics doesn't uh, predict the effect of interventions. But there is a, a relationship between causality and statistics, and the first person who <laughs> I think understood this was this uh, uh, a physicist and philosopher, uh, Reichenbach, uh, he wrote a book called The Direction of Time, and he formulated the common cause principle. And this principle says that if uh, we see, or if we encounter two observables, X and Y, that we find to be statistically dependent, then there must be a third observable, Z, that causally influences both. So he says that no, there's no statistical dependence without uh, underlying causality. Um, this means in the generic case, we would have Z causally influences X and Y, so these errors are causal. Uh, as special cases, Z might coincide with X or Y, in which case we would want to get one of these graphs. Now, Reichenbach goes on to say that uh, this quantity Z then screens X and Y from each other in the sense that, uh, conditioned on Z, the observables X and Y become independent. So that's uh, maybe not so easy to understand, but uh, it's actually almost equivalent to this model that might be easier to understand. And this is uh, maybe the current gold standard for how people think about causality. Uh, it's called a fu functional causal model or a structural causal model or a nonlinear structural equation model. And this is interesting. It's also uh, somewhat related to programming, I think, uh, even though people usually don't think about it that way. So the idea here is we have a set of observables, x1 through xn. Uh, they are embedded in a causal structure described by a directed acyclic graph. Again, the arrows in this graph uh, represent direct causal links. And uh, on e each observable, we further assume, is a function uh, of its parents in this graph and a variable ui, which is not shown here. So these variables ui, now we assume to be independent random variables. These are sometimes thought of as noise variables or uh, unexplained variables. That's why they're called u. Everything else is deterministic. So these functions are deterministic. Uh, the only source of noise are these variables u. And uh, this uh, so-called structural equation uh, is actually, I wrote it as an assignment because it's not really an equation. We're not allowed to solve for the right-hand side, but this equation says, if we change some values over here, we know how this one would change. But if we change this one, uh, it will not affect these variables. It will only affect those variables that have uh, xi as one of their parents. So this is an assignment, not an equation. Uh, 
And it turns out that uh, by feeding in these independent random variables, these noise sources at each node, uh, from the graph or, or the graph structure entails a, a certain structure of the joint probability distribution. So I told you this is the sources of noise, everything else is deterministic, but since these are noises, we get a joint probability distribution of all variables, and it turns out that this distribution carries the footprint um, of the graph structure, and, uh, and this is uh, described by what people call the causal Markov condition. Uh, this is also, as an aside, uh, a so-called graphical model, but uh, actually, and every graphical model can be written this way, but this is a little bit uh, a richer description than a graphical model. This contains information that a graphical model doesn't contain. Anyway, so this uh, uh, brief summary, what now people, what it was the causal, the, the central question of causal inference now is, suppose you're given this joint distribution, can you recover the graph structure from it? So can you uh, infer what is called, what is, what is effect, uh, what are these errors, just from observational data? It's a complete knowledge of the distribution. And but it turns out even complete knowledge uh, is often not enough. So it turns out that if we have at least three variables, uh, we can uh, test for uh, such structures using conditional independence tests because, as I told you in this previous slide, uh, this structure together with the independent noises uh, implies certain uh, conditional independence statements. Um, this works only for three or more variables because every conditional statement connects three variables. Um, now it's interesting to think about what do we do if we have only two variables, uh, and that's a problem that we thought a lot about in the last six or seven years. Uh, and we have developed uh, and analyzed various methods that can handle the case of two variables. And it turns out we have to make additional assumptions. So it turns out the three variable case uh, can be done using this assumption of independence of the noises that I talked about before. Uh, in two variable case, it turns out we can make an assumption of independence of noises and functions or independence of inputs and mechanisms, as we like to call it, uh, and then solve that problem. But I, I don't have time to, to discuss this now. So just to flag what kind of problems are people interested in. And now I think I'll go to the last, uh, last application because I would like to really show you about that. Um, and this is an application in the field of exoplanet uh, search. So here in this application, we're working with data from this uh, Kepler uh, space telescope uh, or satellite uh, circling around the sun. So this is a telescope that has been uh, staring at the same patch of the Milky Way for about four years, um, taking, pic taking a sequence of pictures half an hour uh, of half an hour exposure each. And uh, this is how the telescope looks. Uh, the field of observation is close to this constellation Cygnus. Uh, one image looks like this. So this is a set of CCDs, uh, uh, imaging chips. And uh, we are interested in 150,000 stars in this field. Um, and what we're looking for is uh, transits. So a transit means uh, we're looking at a star which is occasionally partially occluded by its planet. Whenever this happens, we get a slight dip in the light curve. This dip is quite small because planets are much smaller than stars. So for instance, the Earth is about 1% uh, of the diameter of the Sun, so 10 to the minus 2. So the area is about 10 to the minus 4 of the Sun, and the signal is uh, roughly a 10 to the minus 4 signal in this case. Uh, and as seen from space, an uh, Earth transit would last about half a day. It would be visible only from half a percent of all directions. Now we found a lot of planets using it, but nothing uh, quite like uh, Earth and Sun, because uh, Earth is, is difficult to find to begin with, and it, it only produces one transit per year, and we have only four years of observation. So this is a hard problem. And it's especially hard because we have a lot of systematic errors, uh, because the spacecraft changes. Uh, the spacecraft uh, has to stabilize itself very precisely. Uh, the stars have to be very precisely on the same pixel, but even if we shift by a fraction of a pixel, it makes a difference. Um, it has to compensate for things like radiation pressure from, from the sun, etc. cetera. Um, so these noises are bigger than the actual signals we're looking for. And this is the kind of thing that we now want to model causally. And the way to do this is, so our data, so this is the, the true thing out in space, the, let's call this variable Q, that's what we're interested in, our quantity of interest. Uh, we can't measure directly. What we can measure is these observed light curves, and these are now light curves of pixels belonging to the same star. So the star is smeared out over a number of pixels, 
And you can already see that these be pixels behave slightly differently. Some of them decrease, others increase. The scale is blown up, of course. And uh, the reason for this is that the star moves around a little bit on the CCD just by fractions of a pixel. And uh, so what we measure is actually not the star itself, but we measure some derived quantity that's influenced by the star and influenced by these noise sources. Now, reconstructing Q from Y is impossible. But, but fortunately, we have a little bit more. We have lots of other stars. We have this whole measurement field, and we have the light curves of the other stars as well. And the idea now is that uh, these other stars are also affected by noise, and they are partly affected by the same noise processes. Because if you look at these curves, you see some similarities. Like this one looks quite similar to this one, even though these stars are probably light years apart out in space. So we have a situation where if we have a joint noise source, which we'd like to remove, we know that it affects different variables, and we want to reconstruct the underlying hidden quantities. And this uh, we call these uh, uh, related quantities half-siblings, because they share one parent. And the problem is similar to something we call the milkman problem, uh, which looks as follows. So in the milkman problem, so you know there are these um, statistics. They may not be true, but some people claim that uh, as much as 20% of all children uh, might not have the father that they think is their father. So uh, in this case, and in England, uh, then such a child is called the, milk, uh, the milkman's, I believe. Uh, so now the problem is, for us, uh, we have a set of children, uh, and uh, we don't want to uh, find who is the milkman's child, but actually we want to uh, reconstruct how the milkman looks from the set of children without having seen the mother. So this is uh, obviously a non-trivial problem, and, uh, but uh, you can understand the intuition, probably. So X, the other stars, know something about our star of interest because they are affected by the same noise. Moreover, X is independent of our star of interest because the star of interest is light years away. So there's no way this star would directly uh, causally influence uh, the other stars that influence X or the the systematic effect of the instrument. Um, so therefore, if we try to predict uh, our star of interest from the other stars uh, and remove this prediction, we will only remove that component that's due to the, the joint noise source. So that's what we want to remove. And we can uh, formalize, so we call this a half-sibling regression, because this quantity here, that's the conditional expectation, that's also called regression in statistics. So the best explanation of y in terms of x, and then the average, the expectation. Um, I think I should come to the conclusion, but I just wanted to tell you that one can prove some results about this, and I think it's quite nice. Uh, what one can prove, if we uh, make the assumption of additivity, so we assume that the unknown uh, star uh, has, is affected by the noise in this additive way, so it's some non possibly nonlinear function of the noise, but it's added on. If we moreover assume this causal structure, which, as, which implies that X is independent of the Q, um, and if we finally assume that in principle the information about the effect of the noise, about F of N, is there in the other stars. So there exists some function psi that this, such that this equality holds true. We don't need to know this function. So if we assume all this, then it turns out that by subtracting the regression, so this is the regression from the observed y, uh, we recover a quantity q hat, which we can prove is equal to the unknown star q minus its expectation. So this means uh, we can reconstruct the, car, the star up to its expectation. And uh, this is an equality of random variables. So that means every time uh, we make an observation, uh, the probability that this quantity here, this is a random variable, and this one, so this is the one that we can reconstruct. This is the true one that we don't know. The probability that the values that we generate differ is zero. So this is as, as much as you can ever hope for in, in statistics. Um, we can generalize this. We can weaken some of these assumptions, but I think I will I will skip this. Uh, I'll just show you the kind of results we get. So this is uh, uh, typical results that the astronomers get. So that's the light curve. They, uh, they also have a pipeline of pre-processing and trying to remove systematic errors. And uh, this is the kind of result that we get. And uh, we have a lot more, but I'll, I don't show you so much. But uh, I should also say that uh, uh, 
exoplanet search is not just about removing noise, but also it's about finding these dips. So this is an exoplanet here, but that's a very easy one. Finding them, uh, uh, integrating information over multiple periods, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, this is, uh, involves a lot of other things, but we have also done that and uh, produced a list of exoplanets candidates, and some of them have already been confirmed. And I think uh, maybe at this point I should, uh, I should stop. I was also thinking of involving you in a discussion about the future of AI. We can do this afterwards or in the break if you still want to discuss. Um, but I think I should uh, conclude now and thank you for your attention. So you said with a Gaussian kernel, you retain all the information of the, uh, of the observed data. Yeah. Is that a problem space-wise? To or is that a problem? Is that a problem space-wise? I suspect you're not storing it explicitly. Does it somehow become a problem if you want to observe a lot of data? Um, it's usually considered a, a feature of the Gaussian kernel that we retain all the information. So in principle. Um, I suppose it depends what you want to do with it exactly, but uh, but in principle, it's an, an, adva an advantage uh, that you retain all the information. Now you can approximate things, and, and if you represent them with limited uh, accuracy, um, then in the end you might lose information anyway. And, and if you have finite accuracy, you may not be able to distinguish between a kernel that's characteristic, such as a Gaussian, or a kernel that's almost characteristic, or if you take a Gaussian and you um, limited to compact support or something like this, you would get something that's almost the same, maybe up to machine precision, but mathematically is no longer characteristic. So this is, let's say for the mathematical analysis, it's, it's nice to have this, but of course it would be interesting to uh, propagate this through and think about uh, uh, what happens to all this if we represent things with finite accuracy. Yeah. More questions? Otherwise, Bernard will uh, join us for dinner tonight and possibly at the demo fest as well. So uh, thanks again. Thank you.